the Desert Dweller was one of the most influential people in history, who ate locusts and wild honey and wore camel's hair clothes with a leather belt. You've most likely heard stories about this ministry and life. By the passion that drove John the Baptist's life, we are compelled to look closer and draw wisdom from the heart of this powerful, insightful man. John the Baptist's Prophecy The Old Testament prophets, Isaiah and Malachi, predicted the arrival of John the Baptist. There had been a 400-year gap between the Old and New Testaments, and John arrived to clear the way for the Lord. A voice of one calling, in the desert prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Isaiah 43. Jesus himself said this of John, Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Matthew 11, 11. Matthew 14, 1-2 When Herod Antipas, the ruler of Galilee, heard about Jesus, he said to his advisers, This must be John the Baptist, raised from the dead. That is why he can do such miracles. Herod the Tetrarch, this was Herod Antipas, Herod the great son. The term Tetrarch refers to a person who rules over the fourth part of a country. However, Jewish writers use it more broadly, referring to a governor or a king. Matthew 14, 3 For Herod had arrested and imprisoned John as a favor to his wife Herodias, the former wife of Herod's brother Philip. This infamous woman was Herod the Great's granddaughter and Aristobulus and Bernice's daughter. Her first marriage was with Herod Philip, her uncle, by whom she had Salome. Some time later, she left her husband and publicly lived with Herod Antipas, her brother-in-law, who had previously married the daughter of Aratas, king of Arabia Petraea. Herodias is the unlawful wife of Herod Antipas, the Tetrarch, and had previously been the wife of Herod's brother, Philip. Herodias, as Herod the Great's granddaughter, was a niece to both of her husbands, Philip and Antipas. Herodias is the feminine form of Herod and serves as a title for members of the Herodian dynasty. Historians believe Herod Antipas and Herodias had an affair while her husband Philip was in Rome. Herodias divorced her husband to marry Herod Antipas. The new marriage was not honourable, whether motivated by lust or simply a power play, and John the Baptist publicly condemned their adultery. Herodias held a grudge against John and desired his execution. Mark 6, 19 Matthew 14, 4 John had been telling Herod, It is against God's law for you to marry her. Because John told him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. This response is an example of zeal, fidelity and courage that should be emulated. Plainness, mildness and modesty are qualities that must be exhibited when we criticize the great. The best service a subject can render his prince is to lay before him, plainly but respectfully, what God's law requires of him and what it forbids. How unfathomable the punishment must be for those who serve as chaplains to princes or great men and either flatter them in their views or wink at their sins. Matthew 14, 5 Herod wanted to kill John, but he was afraid of a riot because all the people believed John was a prophet. He feared the crowd. It is a miserable prince who fears offending his people more than offending God by shedding innocent blood. When a man resists sin solely through human motives, he cannot defend himself for long. Matthew 14 6 to 7. But at a birthday party for Herod, Herodias' daughter performed a dance that greatly pleased him, so he promised with a vow to give her anything she wanted. Herod's birthday 
was either the day he was born or the day he began to reign. Both were referred to as birthdays. During the entertainment, the kings of Persia were accustomed to rejecting any petition that was preferred to them. Matthew 14, 8 At her mother's urging, the girl said, I want the head of John the Baptist on a tray. Give me the head of John the Baptist in a charger. The word charger is used to refer to a large dish, bowl, or drinking cup. What a devious mother to give such orders to her child. What a present for a young lady, the bloody head of the slain forerunner of Jesus. And what gratification for an adulterous wife, the disturber of her illicit pleasures and the troubler of her brother husband's conscience is no more. Short, however, was their glory. Then the king regretted what he had said, but because of the vow he had made in front of his guests, he issued the necessary orders. So John was beheaded in the prison. Matthew 14, 9 The king was sorry. He knew John to be a righteous man. Nonetheless, for the sake of the oath, which he had most likely repeated, one sin begets many. And his head was brought on a tray and given to the girl, who took it to her mother. Matthew 14, 11. His head was given to the damsel who brought it to her mother. When reproved and blamed, no one is more vengeful than a lascivious woman. A preacher of the gospel has the most to fear from this quarter. The first of this profession died for the sake of truth and chastity. And others, especially those who have anything to do with profligate men in power, may learn what they can expect in return for a faithful discharge of their duty. Later, John's disciples came for his body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus what had happened. Matthew 14, 12 his disciples came and took up the body. The head was in possession of Herodias, who, it is likely, took a devilish pleasure in viewing that speechless mouth, which had frequently been the cause of planting thorns in her criminal bed, and in offering indignities to that tongue, from which she could no longer fear reproof. An unhappy mother who exposes her daughter to the same shipwreck herself has suffered and makes her own child the instrument of her lust and revenge. When Jesus heard of it, he departed. Had the blessed Jesus remained in that place, the hand of this impure murderer would likely have been stretched out against him as well. He withdrew, therefore, not out of fear, but to teach his messengers to yield to the storm rather than expose themselves to destruction, where the case is hopeless. Sin is analogous to a spider spinning a web of guilt. It all begins with a single strand. Thread after thread is spun until a trap for its victim is formed. Herod was weaving a web of sin, ignoring his troubled conscience. However, unlike a wise spider, he became entangled in his own web of deception. Two strands, in particular, cling to him. The first is zeal. It was his birthday, so the palace was set up for a celebration. Herodias' daughter would dance for Herod as a special treat. Salome knew how to please with her artful trade. As an indication of his uncontrolled passion, Herod offered her a blank check, one he'd soon regret. Pride is the second strand of Herod's sticky web. Salome had discussed her options with her mother. Herodias had little need to think about her vengeful hatred for John. His bravery in confronting her about her marriage to Herod was evident, and his death was more than likely caused by her embarrassment. Salome went back to Herod and requested that John's head be brought to her. Herod had become entangled in his web. The guests were waiting for his decision. Not wanting to be perceived as weak or unwilling to carry out his offer, Herod ordered John's death. Pride was hot on the heels of passion, and the king 
was defeated. Proverbs is correct. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Herod said, Whom I beheaded. This is the power of conscience. He is miserable because he is guilty, being continually under the dominion of self-accusation, reproach and remorse. There is no need for the Baptist any longer. Conscience serves as 10,000 accusers. To add insult to injury, a guilty conscience offers no relief from God, no salvation from sin. As destructive and wasteful as he was, he did not consider it impossible for God to raise the dead. And the spirit of the slain Baptist had a permanent resurrection in his guilty conscience. Herodias is not mentioned much in the Bible, but her actions in the Gospels show her to be an immoral, bitter and manipulative woman. John the Baptist was correct in warning the Tetrarch and his wife about their evil ways, and Herodias had ample opportunity to repent. Rather than taking the path of life, Herodias hardened her heart and plotted John's execution. As if silenced, the truth-teller would absolve her of her guilt. As a result, Herodias resembled Jezebel, who vehemently opposed Elijah, in whose power and spirit John had come. You see, even a wicked person, as cruel as Herod and Herodias, has something called a conscience. The conscience can be disregarded. It can be seared, in the words of 1 Timothy 4.2, as with a hot iron, but it can't be done away with altogether. The conscience of an evil individual may lie dormant for many years, but then an unpredictable event or sequence of possibilities bring to mind evil acts that were done before. Consider Joseph's brothers. They cleverly covered what they had done when they traded Joseph into slavery. They had persuaded their father that Joseph had been ripped to shreds by some wild creature. They lived with that evil suppressed inside for many years. But when they were confronted by a fierce monarch in Egypt, whom they did not identify as their brother, they said to each other, Surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why this distress has come upon us. Reuben replied, Didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an accounting for his blood. Genesis 42, 21-22 In their case, God shocked their hardened consciences with a jolt of reality, reminding them of what they had done. A similar action was taking place with Herod, but it was not resulting in godly sorrow and repentance. Instead, his awakened conscience led him to the unrest caused by guilt, as described in Isaiah 57, 20 to 21. But the wicked are like the tossing sea, which cannot rest, whose waves cast up mire and mud. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. God did not let Herod rest from his evil deeds and rash vow. When Herod heard about the miracles Jesus performed, he remembered what he had done to John the Baptist. Only those who have a saving faith in Christ experience a peace that surpasses all understanding, having inner peace even in the most horrifying external circumstances. On the other hand, the wicked will always be like the tossing sea, with no rest, peace or contentment, even in their drunken revelry. And, by the way, this is how we should pray for those who refuse to repent and believe only in Christ. You undoubtedly have friends, neighbours or family members who have heard the gospel but refuse to repent and believe in Christ. Pray that they will find true peace in Him alone. Anyone can find peace through saving faith in Christ. A second application the righteous's reward is not found in this life. 
God frequently bestows great and wonderful temporal blessings on the righteous here and now. The people of God in the Old Testament are described in Hebrews 11. Many of them were highly fortunate and persevered in the face of overwhelming odds. According to the author of Hebrews, I do not have time to tell about those who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their debt, raised to life again. Hebrews 11, 32 to 35a. That is frequently true for God's people, but not always. As in the case of Daniel, God would close the lion's mouths. However, many early church martyrs were shredded to bits by lions in the amphitheater. True, the Lord can deliver his people from the sharp edge of the sword, but he also allows that sword to take the head of a faithful servant like John the Baptist. And the author of Hebrews addresses it as well. Others were tortured and refused to be released, so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, they were sawed in two, they were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. Hebrews 11, 35b to 38. Regardless of the outcome of this life, all God's people will receive the inheritance of heaven, which is freely given to them by Jesus Christ's complete and perfect life, sacrificial death and glorious resurrection. Our reward does not exist in this life. We are to be grateful for every blessing that God bestows on us. But our true blessing, our eternal reward, awaits us in heaven, not on earth. And in whatever comes our way on earth, we are to do as John the Baptist did. Live the Christian life boldly. Confront sin and be willing to sacrifice everything even our lives, if necessary. The brutal martyrdom of John the Baptist also serves as a reminder that the Lord orchestrates all events for his purposes. In this fallen world, there are so many violent, cruel events that make no sense to us. Nonetheless, God employs them for his purposes. In this case, the news of John the Baptist's martyrdom caused a significant shift in Jesus' ministry. Jesus spent more time teaching his disciples after John's martyrdom. He continued to teach the masses, but he spent more time with his disciples, preparing them to minister on their own once his work on earth was completed. The martyrdom of John the Baptist foreshadowed the crucifixion. Although the crowds would still follow Jesus, as described in the next passage with the feeding of over 5,000 people, he would spend more time equipping his disciples to carry on the work of the kingdom. Events that make no sense to us are yet used by God for his purposes and plans. Proverbs 16, 4 says, The Lord works out everything for his own ends, even the wicked for a day of disaster. J.C. Ryle would write, The faithful preacher murdered for doing his duty, and this to gratify the hatred of an adulterous woman and at the command of a capricious tyrant. Truly there was an event here, if ever there was one in the world, which might make an ignorant man say, What profit is it to serve God? But those of us who, by God's grace, know the whole story, that Herod was a weak and sinful king, while Jesus is the perfect, holy, eternal King of kings, know that knowing Christ by saving faith 
is the most significant prophet. Herod never found that out. Herod listened. Mark tells us he even liked to listen. Mark 6, 20. But he never believed. We read in Mark 6 how he recognized John as a righteous and holy man. However, we read in Matthew 14, 5 that he wanted to kill John. Later, he would mock Jesus and allow himself to be mocked. However, all of this worldly gain, kingly riches and pride, died with him. His life and death are summed by the question Jesus puts before each one of us here in this evening, morning. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Matthew 16, 26. Nonetheless, John the Baptist, who died without material wealth or riches, now has all the eternal riches of heaven's storehouse. May we recognize the worth of the kingdom and regard everything as a loss in comparison to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus through saving faith in Him alone.